Sigma Tiger News all up in your grill with the hottest, juiciest beef. Best of the best jobs and travel, Olympic QR codes, and instant karma. <laughs> Welcome to Sigma Tiger News. So welcome back to all my little Sig Tigs and welcome to any prospective Sigma Tigers. Let's dive right in. What do we got today? Boom. Uh, here are the top 10 most attractive employers according to university students broken down by field of study. So if you're a business administration or commerce, economics, something like that, number one, Google. That's where you want to work. Apparently the work environment's great. The headquarters, blah, 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 all that stuff. Lovely benefits. What do we have next? The Royal Bank of Canada. Obviously a bank. Apple. Deloitte. They're a financial institution. TD Bank. JP Morgan. KPMG. Rounding out number seven. That is another financial institution offering financial services. Accounting. Microsoft. Software company. Beyond that as well nowadays. Uh, Goldman Sachs, another bank. Canada Revenue Agency, the CRA. Working for the government, getting those uh, big bucks. Engineering and IT students. Google, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, Amazon. The Canadian Space Agency. Boeing. I don't know about that one anymore. Definitely don't want to... Well, you probably, maybe you do want to work in the safety uh sector in that Boeing office because apparently they need people. Intel, Meta, Lockheed Martin Canada, they are they're in the aviation industry. Natural science students, what do they want to get involved with? Health Canada, makes sense. Environment and Climate Change Canada, Pfizer, Natural Resources Canada, Hospital for Sick Children, awesome. Uh, Parks Canada, Canadian Cancer Society, Canadian Natural Resources Limited, University Health Network and the Canadian Space Agency. Sounds like a lot of government jobs there. Uh, liberal arts, fine arts, education, social sciences students. What do they want to do? They want to work for the UN. Of course they do. Canadian Department of Justice. Canadian Security Intelligence Services. CSIS. Good luck getting in there. Health Canada. Employment and Social Development Canada. Sounds like another government agency. Google. Global Affairs Canada. Hospital for Sick Children. Indigo. Not sure what that is. Apple. Law students, where do they want to work? The UN, of course. Canadian Department of Justice. The Lavery Law for Lawyer Law Firm. Interesting. Uh, JP Morgan. Canadian Security Intelligence Agency. Services, sorry. Uh, Global Affairs Canada. Canada Border Services Agency. Look like they have a little bit of an error there with the capitalized E. CBSA. Uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Field Law Group, and Gowling WLG. Not sure what they are either. Health and Medicine Students, Health Canada, Hospital for Six Children, Canadian Cancer Society, Doctors Without Borders, Canadian Red Cross, Alberta Health Services, McGill University Health Center, Pfizer, Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Sunnybrook. So they, they don't tell you why they want to work there. They just probably offered up a big list of places. Which one do, would you want to work? And the people probably went online and was like, which one pays the most? So that's likely what's driving people these days. All right, what's going on here? What do we have? This is uh, the best places to visit. These are the top 15 cities for safety, okay? For 2024, Honolulu claims the coveted first spot despite its vulnerability to natural disasters. Honolulu impresses travelers with its overall safety, making it an ideal travel destination. Even Honolulu's lowest marks are the highest of any destination in that category, says Mueller. Though the island's volcanic origin and location in the Pacific make it an obvious target for a variety of natural disasters from wildfires to typhoons, surveyed travelers perceive Honolulu as an incredibly safe destination for their tropical vacations. There you have it. Coming second on the list is Montreal. Montreal, Quebec, Canada. The Canadian city is recognized above all for its transportation safety, where it gets the highest marks. One concern, according to the BHTP, which is the Berkshire Hathaway uh, travel 
group, whatever it is. Wildfires. Since smoke from fires in northern Quebec can drift down to Montreal, impacting the air quality. And Justin Trudeau is warning everybody about how severe these wildfires are going to be this year. Uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, comes in number three on the list of safest cities, according to the BHTP. Its high ranking is due to its excellent score for women, people of color, BIPOC, and LGBTQ+, alts, safety, as well as safety from terrorism. Rounding out the top five is Sydney, Australia, which receives consistent safety marks from travelers in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, which ranks highly for safety for women, LGBTQ plus travelers, and people of color. Yeah, so Berkshire Hathaway has introduced this new thing where safety is all about uh, the, the gender ideology now. So, like, do they feel safe in your country? Because if they don't, then you don't make the list. The only other U.S. city on the list, World's Safest Cities, is Orlando, Florida, which comes in at number 15, renowned for its theme parks and family-friendly attractions. Orlando gets high ratings for transportation safety and safety against terrorism. While we'd caution travelers against chasing golf balls near Lake Jessup, which is home to about 10,000 alligators, ooh, Orlando has a high ratings for transportation safety and safety against terrorism, blah, blah, blah. All right, so what is the complete list? Let's have a look. The top 15 safest countries, Canada, Switzerland, Norway, Ireland, Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Portugal, Denmark, Iceland, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, France, Spain, and Brazil. And to fill in the list that they didn't quite give us all, we have Honolulu, Montreal, Reykjavik, Sydney, Amsterdam, Dubai, Copenhagen, London, Seoul, South Korea, Venice, Italy, Tokyo, Berlin, Paris, Barcelona, and Orlando. There you have it. You want to visit somewhere that is safe or considered safe due to their uh, transportation, uh, acceptance of alts, and, uh, of course, terrorism. There you go. Boom. Who needs a QR code for getting around during Paris Olympics? A special pass will be needed to circulate in some areas of Paris during the Olympics this summer. As online applications for necessary QR code open Monday, we look at who needs them when and the affected areas. So here is an image of Paris. You can see very densely populated area. From the 18th of July throughout the period of the Olympic Games, 26th, uh, what? Yeah, 26th of July to the 11th of August, some areas of the capital will be sectioned off into zones, and you'll need a pass je Games Pass to move around within them. The pass takes the form of a QR code, which can either be downloaded onto a smartphone or printed out. The Ministry of the Interior platform went live on Monday, and passes will be issued following administrative checks uh, by the Paris Police Prefecture. For the moment, applications concern only the Olympic opening ceremony on the River Seine on the 26th of July, but will be extended to the whole Olympic period shortly. So who needs a QR code? Uh, mainly the people wanting to circulate in restricted areas in motorized vehicles, cars and motorbikes, such as taxis and delivery drivers, as well as people living near the opening ceremony and competition venues. Pedestrians, cyclists, and riders of non-motorized scooters do not need a QR code to enter restricted areas. Yet. Which areas are affected? Four colored code perimeters will be set up around the sites, gray, black, red, and blue. They are laid out in the video below in French, and maps can be found here. If you are interested, you can go ahead and check out rfi.fr. Gray zones have the tightest security. They include the competition venues, and in particular, the 26th July opening ceremony on the River Seine, where some 300,000 spectators are expected. Two six-kilometer stretches of the banks of the River Seine between Austerlitz and Lena Bridges will be designated an anti-terrorist protection perimeter, SILT. Anyone wishing to enter the SILT zone must have either a ticket for the ceremony or a QR code plus a form of ID. Motorists, including residents with car parks in the SILT zone, delivery and emergency service vehicles, need a QR code to enter. After 13 hours on the day of the opening ceremony, no vehicles will be allowed through. Emergency service vehicles will be escorted by police if necessary. There you go. Applicants will have to justify a legitimate reason to enter the silt zone, either because they're residents or hotel clients, and show proof of address, a hotel reservation, or a lease agreement. For example, the Prefet de Police, the Prefet de Police, Laurent Nunez, told France Info. Security checks will be carried out on everyone to be sure the person does not represent a threat to national security, he said. Restrictions on the silt zone will come into effect as of 18th of July, a week before the opening ceremony. So if you're in Paris, France, heads up. You're going to need a QR code to get around. Fusion record paves way for commercial reactors. Yeah, we've been talking about this. If you don't know what's going on, uh, they're trying to get fusion uh, nuclear energy. 
from a reactor, basically like putting two atoms together to create energy. You put a little bit in, and you get a whole lot out. Currently, we're working with fission, where they tear apart or create uh, a separation of the atom uh, to produce the energy. The Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, PPPL, hits a new fusion reactor endurance record that could open the door to practical fusion power on the commercial scale. Sorry, Using a tungsten lining, the West reactor held a reaction for six minutes. South Korea is working on one as well. Uh, they were able to hold, I think it was like, anyway, hotter than the sun. I don't know the exact number, 100 million degrees Celsius or 1,000 degrees Celsius. I can't remember what it was. Fusion reactions may power the sun and make life on Earth possible, but duplicating that process on this planet is currently stuck at two ends of an extreme. On the one hand, fusion can be set off instantly in the heart of a hydrogen bomb with enough energy released to blast a city off the map. At the other, fusion can be induced on a lab bench level at such low energy returns that such a setup was showcased at the General Electric Pavilion in 1964 New York World's Fair, where it regularly fused atoms together for the public. The hard part is getting these two extremes to meet somewhere in the middle. No, that's not right. The hard part is to get them to meet in the form of a reactor that can generate more energy than it takes in on a sustained practical commercial scale. Yeah, put a little bit of energy in, get a massive amount out, and then charge the public exorbitant amounts of money to access it. To do this, the reactor doesn't just need to achieve fusion or to do so for an extended period. It needs to be able to do so on a large enough scale using a machine that can stand up to all the stresses of recreating the conditions in the heart of the sun. According to the U.S. Department of Energy's PPPL, the record, the recent record set by the W, the chemical symbol for tungsten environment in steady state Tomahawk West, of sustaining a reaction for six minutes after an injection of 1.15 gigajoules of power, steady state central electron temperature of four uh, keV isn't an absolute record. There are other tokamaks that have done better West scores in the practicality stakes. Located in the nuclear research center of the Catarache Boucheron in Provence, France, West is a reconfigured version of the Tora Supra Tomamac. During the six-minute run, the plasma suspended inside the reactor's super-powerful magnetic fields reached a temperature of 50 million degrees Celsius, 90 million degrees Fahrenheit, and achieved 15% more energy with twice the plasma density. But the real showstopper was that this was done without a tokamak chamber lined with tungsten. Earlier versions used a graphite lining, which achieved better performance, but graphite tends to absorb the fuel into itself, which is undesirable in the commercial reactor. Tungsten has a much lower rate of this, making it more practical and desirable. However, tungsten atoms can also get into the plasma, rapidly cooling it. All right, so these scientists are working with some serious stuff here, and they're trying to recreate the sun on Earth and contain it so we can juice some energy out of it, so we can power up all these um, chips so we can make AI work better for us. What else is going on? All right, a lot of people are talking about um, the uh, Israeli genocide. Well, what's this guy got to say? Jake Sullivan, there is no genocide in Gaza. Okay, let's see what he has to say. Four, we believe Israel can and must do more to ensure the protection and well-being of innocent civilians. We do not believe what is happening in Gaza is a genocide. We have been firmly on record rejecting that proposition. Boom, there it is. So, case closed, no genocide in Gaza moving forward. Could the avian flu be our next pandemic threat? Okay, this is from Stanford University. The H5N1 bird flu, highly infectious and deadly in birds, has been around for nearly three decades, but recently it has been changing in ways that raise alarms for many scientists and public health officials. In particular, the recent spread of the virus among dairy cows and discovery of genetic traces of the virus in one in five milk samples have sparked concerns that the virus may become more transmissible to humans. No live virus strains of were found in the milk samples. And the Food and Drug Administration says pasteurized dairy products are safe to consume, although raw milk and unpasteurized cheeses should be avoided. But guess what? People are trying to get this raw milk. I read an article earlier. I was going to cover it, but it's paywalled. Um, it was talking about tons of people trying to get their hands on raw milk to consume it. And why? They'd like to build an immunity to the h 5N1 virus. While the public may be weary of pandemic news following four years of COVID-19, now is a critical time for scientists, public health officials, and the general public to take preventative action, says Michelle Barry, MD, director of the Stanford Center for Innovation and Global Health and senior associate dean of global health. And here she is. 
This includes taking steps to protect and monitor the health of livestock and people who care for them through a one health approach, meaning one that fosters collaboration between countries, disciplines, and sectors to prevent disease outbreaks among humans and animals and protect their shared environments. The virus has the potential to seriously disrupt our agricultural supplies and also jump from other mammals to humans and become an epidemic or even a pandemic. And they're all talking like Bill Gates is out there saying, yeah, we need to reduce the amount of beef we're eating. He's working on an uh, uh, inoculation a vaccine, they call it, but it's not, clearly. It's an inoculation. It's a shot that will help prevent uh, burps and flatulence uh, in bovine, in cows. Whatever. Will it work? I don't know. But they're also pushing uh, meat, lab-grown meat. Well, maybe this is their uh, precursor to be like, yeah, well, let's just eliminate cow farming altogether because it's so dangerous. Various responses to the global pandemic threats ranging from the 2014 Ebola epidemic in West Africa to COVID-19 developed recommendations for how the CDC can strengthen its global migration and quarantine division to prevent future pandemics and advises on pandemic prevention as an elected member of the Global Health Advisory Board for the Council of Foreign Relations. Yeah, so uh, what do we do? What is the impact? Nothing. One person had a conjunctivitis. There's a whole bunch of people down in Denver now who are being monitored uh, for uh, the avian bird flu. We'll see. We'll keep you posted, as we always do. Top banker's cross-dressing son, 19, is arrested in Bahamas for groping a woman at a 90k a year members-only club before her husband slapped him. Well, Spencer Charrington, 19, was arrested on suspicion of sexual assault after Diana Gagnon, 35, claimed he touched her hip area at a New Year's Eve party. Gagnon's husband, Felipe, 55, a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, slapped Charrington in the face he was arrested and kicked out of the uh, exclusive club. The teens who studying at a liberal arts college in Maryland was eventually arrested and released without charges. All right, so uh, he was arrested on suspicion of sexual assault after she claimed he touched her hip area from behind as she danced at a Moulin Rouge party. So he just kind of like creeped up to her and got a little friendly for a little dance while her husband, Felipe Gagnon, was not impressed and he warned Spencer to get the f out of here. Then he slapped him twice in the face. I wonder if it was a left, right, or a double tap. Anyway, when he refused to back off, it's alleged. Gagnon, a Canadian expat, was arrested four days after a $1,000 per head New Year's Eve bash at the opulent Albany Development, one of the most exclusive resorts in Caribbean. He's charged with causing harm to Spencer, whose dad, Peter Sherrington, led Citibank's private banking division before stepping down in 2020 to become a senior executive partner at Albany's parent company. Here's an image of uh, Sherrington dressed up uh, in a dress, it looks like. And here's uh, Gagnon, the alleged victim, with her little Christian cross there. So she probably felt the touching was very inappropriate. And here is uh, her husband there who slapped Sherrington silly. The image of the resort. Yeah, so Gagnon say their 90000 per year membership was suspended in the wake of the spat and that Diana was escorted from the premises midway through a tennis game. Yikes. The dispute was far from over, however, as she lodged her own complaint about Spencer's behavior with the Royal Bahamas Police Force, leading eventually to his arrest on April 4th. The teenager who attends McDaniel College, a liberal arts college in Westminster, Maryland, told officers he was merely complimenting Diana on her ornate feathered dress and didn't assault her. Perhaps it was an overreaction. He was released without charge pending further investigation. Spencer's Bahama-based attorney, uh, Guiana Souls Hunt, did not respond to multiple calls and emails requests to comment. Albany, Bahamas was founded on the island of New Providence 2010 by British billionaire Joe Lewis with the investment from Tiger Woods and Justin Timberlake. 600-acre complex boasts a mega yacht marina, championship caliber golf course designed by two-time U.S. Open winner Ernie Els, and even has its own school. Jailed crypto fraudster Sam Bankman Fried, SBF, owned a $40 million penthouse atop one of Albany's Lux apartment buildings until it was seized by regulators to claw back funds from his collapsed FTX empire. The resort is said to operate a strict no photos or autographs rule to protect the privacy of well heeled celebs who flock to the gated hideaway to enjoy the upscale facilities and powdered white private beach. A lawyer representing both Spencer and Albany wrote to the Gagnons on February 14th proposing a settlement in which the two sides would agree to pay. One another $100 in damages and dropped all for the charts. The deed of release would have barred everyone involved from speaking to the media, but Felipe and Diana declined to sign it as it didn't reinstate their Albany memberships. Yeah, so they were like, we want to get back in. Uh, we paid 90 grand, 180 total, to access this place, and I got groped by a creepy guy who wears dresses, and I didn't like it one bit, and my husband told him to stop, and clearly he didn't, so he got a little one-two, and there you go. 
Gagnon, an engineer and businessman, were released on $1,500 bail but faces up to six months in jail if found guilty at a June 3rd trial, though he'll likely avoid a custodial sentence as he has no prior criminal record. The dad of five told police he warned Spencer to go away multiple times and did not strike him with a closed fist or draw blood. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. If someone's there and they're uh, assaulting or being inappropriate uh, with touching, touching is very inappropriate. Absolutely should not be done. Absolutely not. At any situation, even a hand on the shoulder, it's inappropriate. Just don't do it, okay? So the dude's creeping on his missus, and he's like, bro, back up. And he's like, no, I love her dress. And he's like, dude, back up. And he didn't listen, so he gave him an open-handed strike, which I think is totally reasonable for the situation. It's no different than giving someone a shove. Anyway, I was subjected to humiliating and frightening assault as he stepped in to ensure my safety. I feel it's unfair that police only charge Felipe since two witnesses to the alleged groping came to the police station and gave statements. Well, that's the Christian way. If you got two witnesses, that's it. That is a fact. My existence is a scandal, he wrote. My goodness. Uh, anyway, whatever. Good luck to everyone. Here's something awesome. Check this out. Boom. You don't see this every day. Tune in. Let's get a replay. Boom, ain't that something, people? A volcano erupting and then lightning striking it? Absolutely amazing. You don't see that stuff every day. You gotta love it. All right, let's move on. What do we got? Tennessee governor okays bill allowing death penalty for child rape convictions. Yeah, we covered this a few months ago. It was in the legislative session. And uh, Tennessee governor Bill Lee approved legislation allowing the death penalty in child rape convictions. A change the Republican-controlled statehouse championed amid concerns that the U.S. Supreme Court has banned capital punishment in such cases. Lee, a Republican, quietly signed off on the legislation last week without issuing a statement. The new Tennessee law, which goes into effect July 1st, authorizes the state to pursue capital punishment when an adult is convicted of aggravated rape of a child. Those convicted could be sentenced to death, imprisonment for life without possibility of parole, or imprisonment for life. So here's the deal. Uh, do no harm to the child. That's Jesus's way. And he said, if you did, you'll get a millstone wrapped around your neck and dumped into the ocean. Jesus ain't playing homeboy. So don't be messing with the kids. Okay. And uh, our governor here in Tennessee, Bill Lee, totally knows all about that. Uh, so Idaho and Florida have approved similar legislation earlier this year, but the proposal eventually uh, stalled in the similarly Republican-dominated Senate. So, uh, yeah, if you're out there and you uh, are a minor attracted person, formerly known as a pedophile, and you uh, act upon your immoral desires, then you could likely end up dead. Okay? Funds for Ukraine diverted to fake companies. What? I mean, didn't they give them billions of dollars? Martinana Bolshlavitz, director of the Meza Anti-Corruption Center, has raised alarms over the misappropriation of funds in Ukraine amidst an ongoing military conflict with Russia. Writing in Pravda, uh, Bolshlavitz uh, reports that millions of dollars were transferred to Kharkiv OVA to front companies of avatars. She claims that money intended for constructing military fortifications was instead siphoned off to Kharkiv Regional Military Administration. In turn, Kharkiv OVA channeled the money into phantom companies. The issue has entered the spotlight just as Russian forces have penetrated the northern region of Ukraine. Yeah, they basically said they walked on in. That's what the Ukrainians are saying. They walked in. So what happened to all that money? Because it was dire, you know, to help fight it off. And here we go. We'll end it off with some instant karma. We love it. Sex attacker tries to grope female train passenger, then loses his arm when the tram hits him during scuffle with crowd who came to the victim's aid in Germany. So we have a Tunisian man, uh, 22. He uh, attacked someone, tried to grope a female train passenger, ended up losing his arm when a locomotive hit him. All right, so he tried to kiss and grope a woman, 25, on a tram in the German city of Stuttgart. In the early hours of Sunday, according to federal police, other passengers rushed to the victim's aid and left the train with her assailant at the next stop at Osterfield Station, the city's Vyingen district. 
A scuffle between the Tunisian, a second man, and other passengers ensued on the platform, during which the unknown man reportedly got physical with the sex attacker, causing him to fall onto the tracks. The man was hit by an oncoming tram and was seriously injured. He was taken to hospital where one of his arms was amputated during emergency surgery outlet. So that's what you call sweet irony. Okay? Keep your hands to yourself, people. We talked about it earlier. Absolutely do not touch people, okay? And if you do require uh, the necessity to touch someone, ask them first. Hey, do you mind if I pass by? Excuse me, may, may I get by? Or, you know, like, but number one, don't ever come behind someone and put your hand on their shoulders and begin a massage. Number one, don't ever do that, okay? Number one. Sigma Tiger, signing off.